podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Hi, I'm Tom Linden. Nearly every day we hear about threats to our environment, oil spills, climate change, and the loss of species and habitats. Many of us feel powerless to make a difference, but some people are working to protect our environment. That's why we call them environmental heroes. North Carolina is home to some of the most beautiful spots in the country, including the Great Smoky Mountains, where scientists have documented 10,000 species, including some of the biggest trees in the eastern United States. But a tiny invader, smaller than a pin, is killing hemlocks from Massachusetts in the north to Georgia in the south. One environmental hero is trying to save some of these majestic trees before it's too late. And they're just like, friends to me because I can go back and I know this spruce, I know that spruce. Black Mountain arborist and tree climber Will Blozan loves trees. Every tree is different. Blozan says he feels a special connection with the eastern hemlock, a tree some call the redwood of the east. It's as soon as I could stand up, probably I started climbing things and climbing trees came naturally. To me, the, the hemlock forest actually represents some of the least disturbed ecosystems we have left in the eastern U.S. That was until a tiny Asian insect, the woolly adelgid, hitched a ride to this country on an imported plant at least 60 years ago. In the last 20 years, the adelgid has spread from Canada in the north to Georgia in the south, killing hemlocks in its wake trees that are actually 500 years or more old and an ecosystem that's been functioning for millennia undisturbed until now and this insect is erasing one of the last vestiges of these um, ancient woodlands that we have. I became very passionate and interested in eastern hemlock particularly uh, in 1993 when I started working for the National Park Service and my job, my, my dream job really, I got to walk in the woods all day, look for old trees, take core samples, get ages, take diameters, and document these great eastern hemlock forests. And thinking at the time, this was in 93 to 95, that nothing could ever hurt these things. And it blew my mind how wrong I was. I mean, to, go, to see these forests in their prime and now going back to these same groves and they're completely dead, stone dead. U.S. Forest Service entomologist Rusty Ray has fought the adelgid since it first appeared in the southeast. It attaches itself to the base of the needle near the twig junction, uh, inserts its stylet, which is like a straw, and feeds on plant uh, stored uh, plant materials that the plant would use uh, to um, maintain itself throughout the year. After several years of this, the tree usually dies. Um, in the southeast, we're seeing mortality in four to five years. This past first appeared on the East Coast in Richmond, Virginia in 1951 and spread from there to Shenandoah National Park where more than 80 percent of the hemlocks are now dead. Birds and wind carry the insect that has spread much faster than scientists expected. In 2001, Blozan was climbing in the forests of South Carolina. And as I was coming down the tree, I brushed up against, I noticed some fluff on me and noticed this when the other climber had found a sprig that had full-blown infestation of woolly adelgid on it. And on the way home, I called the Forest Service and the Park Service and said, there's woolly adelgid in South Carolina. There's no way, because it was, you know, it's a couple of hundred miles from its, you know, or at least 150 miles from where we thought it had, was and went down a few days later and, and looked at the trees and they were definitely infested. 
Now the Adelgid has infected hemlock forests across North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. It was like a nightmare coming true because I had just really pushed it out of my mind that this was, this was something I was going to have to deal with. And it, it just it hit hard. The hemlocks mean so much to me. And that, that was the day of their demise in my eyes. The loss of eastern hemlocks threatens an entire ecosystem that provides food and shelter for many birds, other wildlife, and diverse plant life. And it's not just the trees, it's everything dependent upon the tree. The whole balance of the forest is completely upset. Streams are cool because of the hemlocks and the dense shade they create. Um, when you remove those hemlocks, and if the temperature of those, some of those streams goes up as little as one degree, trout aren't going to be able to survive in them. Biology professor Stuart Skeet saw these losses firsthand when the Adelgid invaded Hemlock Hill near Lees McRae College in the mountain community of Banner Elk. We started looking into the possibilities of, of how to save the hemlocks, essentially. Um, another number of different options were offered. Uh, one option was using a chemical treatment where you would either inject the tree or inject the soil around the tree. This is a tree that's been treated twice uh, with systemic insecticides. It's maintained its lower canopy, its lower branches, and the top's green. We were looking for a long-term solution, more ecology-based. Essentially what we were looking for is setting up a system here, an ecological system, where we had predators that would feed on the adelgid and control the adelgids. One such predator is a beetle. Laracobius nigrinus, native to the Pacific Northwest. By introducing this beetle that feeds only on the hemlock-eating adelgid, biologists are trying to control the adelgid in a sustainable way. They've already released beetles in test sites at Hemlock Hill and elsewhere. We released them in 2003, and in 2004 we had our first generation, meaning that they survived the winter, they then survived the spring and summer, and they re-emerged in the fall of 2004. Since that time, they have reappeared each year, and this year will be the sixth generation of Laracobius nigrinus on Hemlock Hill. But the beetles are hard to collect and expensive to breed and release. It may take years to raise enough beetles in the forest to keep the fast multiplying adelgid in check. This client here chose to use biological control as their sole means of uh, combating the hemlock woolly adelgid. And they're probably here, but they're not, obviously they haven't saved the canopy. Wow, it is such a difference. This dark fern-like foliage almost, and then barren. Most experts agree a combination of methods, pesticides, and biological controls like beetles are needed to save the hemlocks. We haven't to date. I uh, discovered that there's a silver bullet, if you will, of a, an insect that's going to do the job. So we're using chemicals um, uh, on a large scale in the southeast, especially as a stopgap method for the most part. But it's basically to keep some trees alive until we can get our biological controls um, up and running and established in numbers that'll, that'll help maintain the tree. The hemlocks are being put on life support right now until a better solution comes up. But I hope that there's a day, the day comes that we won't need to keep them on life support anymore. Some insecticides work quickly and dissipate fast, and that can buy the trees the time for the biological control populations to build and maybe take over the job. To try to save the remaining hemlocks, groups have sprung into action all over the southeast. They're all sitting around the table going, we got to stop this and we've got to do something about it, and that's been really, really a great thing. Will Blozan has taken his fight to save the hemlocks beyond his tree care business. He speaks with groups around North Carolina and throughout the country. He's also started shooting a documentary with friend and filmmaker David Huff to rally support for the cause. The birds, the insects, everything that depend on hemlocks need a place to be. And we, can, we have the opportunity as humans capable of managing these forests to provide that habitat for them. I have no sympathy for apathy. There is no reason to not do something. There are easy and economical options to save hemlocks on a, on a limited scale, of course, but it can be done, and I think it should be done.
More than 200 miles from the Great Smoky Mountains in the rolling hills of the North Carolina Piedmont sits a small farm where two enterprising people decided 30 years ago that they could improve this patch of land. Worldwide, farm experts say up to 40 percent of croplands are experiencing soil erosion, reduced fertility, or overgrazing. Our current industrial farm model relies on huge amounts of fossil fuels that contribute to climate change and environmental degradation. But it doesn't have to be that way. On these three to four acres of cropland in eastern Alamance County, you won't see much heavy machinery. Instead, two environmental heroes practice a form of sustainable agriculture. Their aim, as they say, is to improve the quality of life that renews them, their community, and their land. Alex and Betsy Hitt manage their 26-acre peregrine farm in eastern Alamance County, 16 miles west of Chapel Hill. For almost 30 years, the Hitts have grown more than 300 varieties of vegetables, fruits, and flowers. Alex and Betsy met at Utah State, where they both studied agriculture. In the early 1980s, they started a small farm to make a living without harming the land. For good or bad, probably good, I think, uh, we had, there was no family land, and there was no family money, and there was no one going to lend us money, uh, and so we uh, had to sort of bootstrap it up. We got together when we were in college. He had this plan to have this farm, and I really didn't have a plan as to what I was going to do. And so I thought, well, I, you know, that sounds good. I won't have to wear pantyhose. Obviously. Our goal from the beginning has to has to then do the best job we can with this piece of ground and leave it in better condition, hopefully, than when we found it initially. To do that, the hits minimize plowing. That allows the soil to retain more water and promotes growth of helpful microorganisms. And the real key to soil health is organic matter. That's what the that's what the f bacteria and the fungi and all that stuff live on as they eat that organic matter and then that releases the nutrients to grow these plants. Early on, the hits worried their small-scale operation wouldn't pay the bills. In 1995, a rainstorm ruined their tomatoes, but success with other crops pulled them through. And tomatoes are sometimes a quarter of our business, and so we thought, wow, this is, we could be in trouble. And uh, it turned out we had the best year we'd ever had gross income-wise. And that was sort of the first time we said, okay, the system really does work. We are diversified enough. We have a sustainable, resilient system that allows us to keep going. During the growing season, the Hits hired two workers who help in the fields and with cleaning and crating of vegetables for market. It's a hands-on operation, so the product costs a little more than what you'd pay at the supermarket. But patrons at the Carborough Farmers Market say the quality and freshness are worth it. You know, there's pretty broad consensus that the food that's that's purchased and consumed from these kinds of markets tends to be fresher, tends to be more recently picked. Uh, I think there's a lots of people seem to really enjoy themselves when they come to these farmers markets. There are people are are really looking for this experience, the experience of connecting with where their food comes from, connecting with the person who produces their food, and getting the kind of quality of food that you're getting by buying straight from somebody who brought it off the farm this morning. It's hard to get them to You haven't tried our chicken yet? No. It's be the best chicken you've ever eaten. Besides running their own business, the Hits hire and train young farmers like Joanne Gallagher, a former employee and now co-owner of Castle Main Farm in Alamance County. I didn't know anything about farming when I started working for them. They have pretty much taught me everything that I know now. Um, and they've been a great support to me and my husband in getting our farm started too. Durham restaurateurs Karen and Ben Barker like to use the Hits produce at their nationally known restaurant, Magnolia Grill. You know, they do things the right way. They understand and are responsive to chefs and their needs. And, and, uh, and we like to think that they give us uh, some of their best quality so that we can turn around and, and give our customers uh, 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 optimal ingredients. <laughs> Most items on the menu feature local ingredients, like the Hits peppers, that Karen Barker candied for a unique dessert. Well, this dessert is a really interesting dessert. It's a hot chocolate chili cake. It's served with a Mexican chocolate ice cream, and the garnish on it is what we use, Alex and Betsy's peppers. They're actually candied chilies, 
um, candied poblanos and red jalapenos, and they just add a spark of color and just a real hint of a little pop of hotness at the end. You can also find the Hits produce at Weaver Street Market in Carborough, where local residents like UNC nutrition professor Alice Ammerman sometimes shops. It's not so much that local or organic foods have a higher nutritional quality, but I think it's more that it gives us an opportunity to try to get people to eat healthier food because it tastes better and because they feel it's contributing to a better environment, a better community. Strengthening community is really important to the HITS. Well, they're definitely leaders and they're also very much in favor of trying to um, assure that local food doesn't just get consumed by high income consumers. To that end, the HITS have served on the board of the Chapel Hill Carborough Farmers Market since 1988 and they don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Clean water, it's hard to put a price on its value. Water here from Falls Lake provides the drinking supply for nearly a half million residents of Wake County. But pollution from this lake is straining the resources of water treatment plants. Unless communities in the Falls Lake watershed clean up their rivers and streams, Raleigh's Public Utilities Department estimates it'll cost more than $250 million to upgrade its water treatment facilities to meet the needs of an expanding population. Streams from five counties flow into Falls Lake. One of the biggest sources of pollution comes from Durham's creeks and rivers. Storm runoff pushes sediment laden with nitrogen, phosphorus, and other pollutants down city streets into nearby creeks. Most Durham residents know about the Eno River, but Few are aware that much of the runoff ends up in little-known Ellerbee Creek that begins near Orange County and then snakes through downtown Durham before pouring into Falls Lake. One organization, the Ellerbee Creek Watershed Association, wants to make local residents aware of the importance and beauty of this creek, both to enhance life in Durham and to protect Raleigh's drinking supply. So we have a meeting planned with the city, the county, and Upper East Clean Water. Executive Director Diana Tetton says the mission of the Ellerby Creek Watershed Association is to clean up what she calls the dirtiest stream entering Falls Lake, north of Durham. That stream is Ellerby Creek. It flows into Falls Lake, which is Raleigh's drinking water, drinking water for 425,000 people. So it's very important to protect for that reason. And the entire site is rated as critical to protecting water quality. Ellerby Creek begins near Lake Swannanoa, half a mile from I-85 on the western edge of Durham. It then flows north of downtown Durham before reaching Falls Lake. The state calls Ellerby Creek an impaired stream. Ugh. Trash litters the river. Oh, that stinks. What you got there, Mike? A heavy television set. Sediment and pollution taint its waters. That bothers NC State Professor Kathy Baratan, member of the Ellerbee Creek Watershed Association Board. You go walk along the bank of Ellerbee Creek and you see these big pipes in the bank of the creek where every time it rains, the water flows straight from the asphalt into the pipe and dumps into the creek with all the trash, with all the stuff out of that parking lot. Like most urban waterways, Ellerby Creek drains a heavily paved landscape. Instead of being absorbed by the land, water, polluted with fertilizers, oil, and other substances, flows directly into the creek, draining most of downtown Durham and nearby neighborhoods. From Lake Swannanoa, the creek runs north of downtown through four watershed preserves before heading east to Falls Lake. But natural areas like a beaver marsh near the site of a large strip mall just off Roxborough Street can help improve water quality. This is the one place that because it's a spring-fed pond and the beavers are here and all like that where there's actually clean water flowing into the stream. And so we want to highlight this as an example of, of how wetlands and vegetated swales and things like that um, can have a real positive impact on the water quality in Falls Lake. Ellerby Creek's water quality wasn't always the main concern. In 1961, the Army Corps of Engineers straightened and channeled the creek to control flooding. The result? 
Water now speeds down man-made channels, eroding banks, and increasing sediment that chokes off aquatic life. It turned out to be not a very good strategy, and in fact um, has increased the flooding and increased the velocity of the water coming down streams. We're having what's called massive bank failure. The bank is just slumping into the stream, and then that soil and sediment is getting carried down to Falls Lake. But even with erosion and pollution, the creek still attracts nature lovers. High school biology student Rashad Trice first came to an Ellerbee Creek watershed preserve on a field trip in 2008. It's just a nice environment and never knew places like this was in Durham until I went to the field trip with Ellerbee Creek Association and I really thank them for that. The organization founded its first preserve, 17 acre wood, nearly 10 years ago. Nearby resident and board member Larry Brockman has long been active with the organization. What I enjoy most about working with the Ellerbee Creek Watershed Association is the opportunity to get uh, people into nature close to their homes. It's great to be able to, to get uh, people who have lived in Durham or maybe been around Durham for a long time and don't even realize the beauty that's in their own backyard. Joanne Abel lives near the Pearl Mill Preserve three blocks from downtown Durham. One of the, the beauties of this kind of park is it can be, a preserve can be a real organizing tool to organize people in the community. We have a cleanup. You really get to know someone when you're standing, you know, hip deep in the muck pulling a sofa out of the creek. So it's a real good way of community building, I think. There we go. Besides cleaning up the creek, the association wants to preserve green spaces that border the stream so that will really open up the um, environment and outdoor experience to everyone in the city and sort of have a green necklace to, from inner city Durham all the way out to the Falls Lake. Our goal is to make the stream a living stream, a living system and an asset for the citizens of Durham and to increase the connection between the stream and its environment and the people who live here. About seven miles downstream of Durham City Center is another preserve, Glenstone, which adjoins a new subdivision. Just upstream from us is a, one of the largest uh, heron rookeries, nesting areas, in the Piedmont. We've had the opportunity to make that uh, heron rookie accessible to people. Even if you look around here in the lower part of the watershed, you'll find trash, plastic bottles that have made their way down uh, to this part of the watershed eventually going into the Falls Lake. From its northern arm, Falls Lake extends about 25 miles to Raleigh's main water purification plant. The plant treats 47 million gallons of water a day, some of which flow from Ellerby Creek's polluted runoff. The best way to deal with that kind of pollution isn't to do water purification plants, which are extremely expensive. It's to put in more little ponds and vegetated swales and rain gardens that function like a beaver pond, where the plants clean the water up like a filter before it ever gets to the stream. By focusing attention on the creek's water quality and its beauty, the association hopes to draw local residents to its cause. Even within this urban setting, we see an, a, a really a wide variety of, uh, of, of not only plants, native plants, but some of the animals that people really love to get out and see. It's really the citizens who live nearby and the citizens of Durham who make uh, everything we do possible. This little stream that flows through an urban landscape has united people from different backgrounds. Working together, they're protecting and restoring natural wonders that can thrive if given the chance. Over the last half hour, we've heard from people who love the natural world and want to preserve it for themselves and for future generations. It's very simple. We all want clean water, healthy forests, and nutritious food. Our lives depend on it. Sound environmental practices also make good economic sense. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says organic farming has become one of the fastest growing segments of U.S. agriculture. Clean water in our rivers and lakes means we don't have to spend millions more on new purification plants. And a thriving forest is one of our best insurance policies against climate change, not to mention its positive impact on tourism and a sustainable lumber industry. If you want to be an environmental hero, support the people who are making a difference. Better yet, find an environmental problem and do something about it. For Environmental Heroes, I'm Tom Linden.
Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.